The collapse of the Central Front had a strong impact on both Army Group North and the XX Army Corps in the South. At the end of June, the right flank of the enemy forces broke through our defences in the area of the heights in front of Ponnots, the 132nd Infantry. Division held a wide sector of the front in front of Yuknovo Muskachevo and on the Velikaya section. On the night of June 28 to 29, a police regiment moved forward to replace the shabby grenadiers holding the positions of I Battalion 437th Grenadier Regiment. There were 60 of us left in the 2nd Company, and we crawled away from our trenches across the swampy terrain which we had held for weeks under the onslaught of superior enemy forces. We passed a tank that had been hit in the winter battles. Its sides already rusty and its hatches open like gaping wounds, and we moved slowly through the swamp on a winding split and burned road. Kettles, sapper spades and other things clinked quietly against the steel helmets hanging on our belts, and the Avans sent bullets after us as we moved away. Five kilometres behind the front line, the battalion gathered on the edge of a small grove that gave the appearance of shelter from the ubiquitous aircraft. Our company field fielder, Novotny, fed us a hot meal and supplied us with some little things we had been unable to get in the weeks we had been on the front lines. For hours we just sat on the side of the road or lay under the tormented pine trees, enjoying the first warm rays of the early morning sun. It was simply a luxury to be able to stand at full height again without fear of anything, to enjoy the freedom of movement again without fear of meeting a sniper's bullet. The obligatory bottle of schnapps was making its rounds. Young and less experienced grenadiers, recently arrived in the thinning company, immediately refused the scalding homemade drink, which left an unusual tingling in the throat. We owed this rare charm to the talent of Field Flebel Rohrer, who skillfully constructed a distilling apparatus from a broken Russian field kitchen that we had captured during the Crimean campaign. He converted the stove for our use with an intricate weave of copper tubing and bits of rubber fuel hoses, and he loaded it with portions of potatoes and rhubarb picked up in abandoned villages or captured in partisan hiding places. Passing the bottle to each other, we felt a subconscious connection that only survivors know. Together we had experienced wind and heat, life and death. We survived hails of bombs and shells. We tended to our wounded, buried the dead, and marched forward into new combat, knowing that we would eventually come to the end of our journey. Most of us owed our lives to the skill and sacrifice of other soldiers from our company, many of whom were no longer with us. We survivors lay on the Russian soil, the smell of which and the touch of which had become so familiar, and dozed in the summer sun. While we were lying quietly in small groups, drinking schnapps and discussing things unrelated to the war, our ideal was interrupted by the rhythmic snoring of approaching horses. Sitting upright, I noticed that Oberleutnant Kaiman, who had recently arrived in the division, was approaching us along with several officers from the regimental headquarters. He stopped his horse a few meters from where I was sitting. Getting up and standing at attention, I mounted and saluted him, trying to give him as much respect as was possible in this setting. Good day, Herr Oberleutnant. I said as I saluted. He stared at me for a while, sitting on his horse, before answering me. Lieutenant Biderman, you are drunk, he said in a loud voice. Yes, Herr uh, uh, Oberleutnant, I replied. Drunk? As I continued to stand, perhaps not quite steady for the straight position, the staff officers began to reproach me for my condition. After a few long seconds of angry tirade, I noticed Fieldfeld Elpinov rising to his feet and heading toward us, holding a long burning cigar in the corner of his mouth. What is going on here? He said sharply, his usually clear and impeccable manners clearly affected by the excessive amount of snaps he had consumed by the roadside. No one dare speak to our lieutenant in that tone. Suddenly he rushed past me and approached the mounted Oberleutnant, exclaimed, we will not allow anyone to treat our lieutenant like a recruit. Without hesitation, I rushed forward, trying to grab him by the shoulder to stop his verbal attacks, while Katzman sat in his saddle, full of indignation, alternately shifting his gaze from me to the approaching field lieutenant, 
Before I could even stop him and Katzman could utter a dickish reply, Pinoff grabbed the bridle at the mouthpiece. Leaning over quickly, as if saying something softly to the horse, he pulled the big animal toward him, holding the bridle. Suddenly, the lighted cigarette touched the sensitive nose of Katzman's horse. The animal sprang up and broke out of Pinoff's hands. The Oberleutnant, taken by surprise, flew out of the saddle and landed on the sandy soil, which all the roadsides of Russian roads are notable for. Some grenadier rushed to him, seized the bridle of the frightened horse, and other soldiers came up to help the officer up. Rejecting their offers, Katzman got up from the ground and calmed his excited horse. He looked at me intently, turned away, jumped into the saddle, and, accompanied by his escort, rode past the hushed soldiers. The enlisted men gathered up the remaining portions of schnapps to exchange for sweets and cigarettes. A tangible amount of fire water found its way to Favoli, Aina, Bainov, and other company commanders, where it was consumed heartily. Some of the men of our company were so generous in distributing the surplus that eventually the source of this disturbance was traced, and I received a verbal reprimand from the regimental commander. I heard nothing more of this roadside incident, although I awaited with dread in my heart a summons for disciplinary action, most likely Oberlutent Ketzman, though characterized by intemperance and tactlessness in his decisions in various situations, well understood that to inflame the incident did not bode well under the circumstances. The battalion commander, Captain Schmalfeld, summoned the company commanders to battalion headquarters to familiarize them with the current situation. He solemnly announced to us that far to the south the enemy had broken through our front, and we were given the task of protecting the open flank of Army Group North from huge concentrations of Russian troops flowing past us to the west. The battalion was hastily loaded into vehicles, and we headed south on roads littered with clouds of dust. By the end of the day we were south of Dune. After a short pause given for the battalion to assemble, we moved south and then got off the vehicles. The grenadiers prepared for battle, tightened the straps of their steel helmets, checked their water flasks, made sure that the machine gun magazines were fully loaded and that the weapons were once again functioning without failure. Tarpaulin pouches with hand grenades were distributed and the grenadiers shared the burden of spare machine gun belts. Suddenly an open all-terrain vehicle pulled up to our position and sitting in the front passenger seat, Oberleutnant Katzman shouted over the roar of the air-cooled Volkswagen engine running. Lieutenant Biderman, now show us what you can do. I put my hand on the edge of my helmet in agreement, and he disappeared in a puff of dust. We struck south, without artillery support, broke through the barrage of Soviet howitzers and soon after came under concentrated mortar fire, but miraculously suffered no casualties. I led the company forward and as soon as we cleared a small height we suddenly found ourselves on a road filled with Russian sappers diligently engaged in mining in the evening twilight. The Russians rushed for cover, at the same time opening fire with machine guns in an attempt to defend themselves, but their unit came under machine gun fire, which was opened by Aina, firing from the hip. The enemy was dispersed and we captured two wagons and a truck under cover of our small arms and hand grenades. Within seconds it was all over, and the guns were silenced. We immediately began to search the corpses with which the road was strewn, and in the passenger seat of the bullet-riddled truck, I found a dying Russian colonel. I quickly searched him, and in the last rays of the setting sun, I found a blood-spattered clipboard, and next to the pleasant-smelling bars of soap and boxes of cigarettes I found documents and maps. Shoving the contents back into the leather bag, I slung it on my shoulder and joined the grenadiers, who were busy searching the carts for more trophies. At this point, the greatest value to the hungry grenadiers was that they had found several cardboard boxes labelled in pencil in English, and they vigorously stuffed their pockets and ration bags with the canned meat found in these boxes. An intelligence officer of the division later confirmed that the documents found with the mortally wounded colonel contained a detailed battle plan of the Third Belarusian Front, and from the maps it was possible to determine the main points of breakthrough of our defences. The documents also contained the basic principles of the new offensive system to be used against 
The offensive would be preceded by a powerful artillery preparation, followed by barrage fire on the flanks of the breakthrough corridor, and behind this inside two walls of bursting shells, tanks and infantry enter the area, often no more than 100 meters wide. Again the enemy uses our tactics. For the rest of the night we did not allow the enemy to use this road. And the next morning we moved south again and arrived at the site of an abandoned Soviet howitzer battery. Dozens of shell casings were scattered amid piles of empty and abandoned boxes labelled Oscar Mayer, Chicago. To the south of us, at the same time, another battalion of our regiment was fighting. Owing to the barrage of this Russian battery, it suffered heavy losses, and the battalion commander, Major Schnepp, his adjutant, Lieutenant von der Stein, and many others fell on the battlefield. As a result of this attack, we went 30 kilometers deep into the open flank of the Russian army, whose formations in this area were aimed straight into a part of our homeland, the Baltic Sea and East Prussia. Forward to Berlin was the slogan of the Soviets. Father Stalin has ordered, and the patriotic front is tearing forward to destroy the hated German invaders. You must march westward to avenge your fatherland the country of workers and peasants. The women of the enemy will be yours. There the water will flow from the walls, and you will be able to wash and drink from porcelain vessels. We instinctively sensed the misfortune that lay ahead, but even the most skeptical among us could not even imagine the fury with which our adversaries from the east would fall upon our motherland. Holding positions from the south, the regiment was bypassed, and the threat of encirclement arose. During the night from June 30 to July 1, we received orders to move south in the direction of Meoria. The battalion was divided into two groups. I was assigned as a group commander in Ambrosius Battle Group, which included two grenadier companies, a reserve company, two self-propelled anti-aircraft guns, and a heavy anti-tank gun. Colonel Ambrosius had recently commanded a non-commissioned officer's course in Riga, and then was pulled out of there in broad daylight with his staff and cadets and thrown into battle. This front, like many others we visited, could be defended only by weak forces. But even then the defence was limited to certain strategically important sectors. Our battle group was assigned to defend a section about two kilometres long. I set up an anti-tank gun and 20mm anti-aircraft guns on the left flank to cover the road that ran through our position to the southeast. The rest of the area was to be defended by infantry companies. Four heavy machine guns and two 80mm mortars reinforced the right flank. With the dawn rays of the sun, the Russians undertook a reconnaissance by combat, putting a company into action. By lunchtime heavy artillery shells began to fall in our sector, and we soon found ourselves under a downpour of shells, which subsided only when the enemy again tried to break through our defences. We held our line of defence until July 4, when the Russians deepened our defences south of our right flank. The first company holding our right flank was forced to counterattack in an attempt to eliminate the enemy breakthrough, and the company commander was among others killed in this battle. At 14.0 our radio went silent. We could no longer establish communication with Colonel Ambrosius and his headquarters in Maioria. In order to establish communication with him in the direction of the right flank a reconnaissance platoon of my old company was sent, and this unit returning could only report that they had found out that the city was occupied by the Russians. Our battle group continued to hold its position in spite of repeated attempts by the Russians to break through our left sector, with infantry reinforced by tanks. In the evening twilight, when the grenadiers were at their battle stations, I, crouched on the ground, was next to the radio operator, who bent over his radio, tried unsuccessfully to establish communication on the old frequency. Mina, Mina, please come online. Mina, Mina, please answer. Dusk thickened. I received an order transmitted through the forward observers of the battery of 150mm guns to withdraw five kilometres to the northwest. We feverishly prepared a withdrawal and under cover of darkness left our positions. The way was paved by our self-propelled anti-aircraft guns, on the chassis of which were full of soldiers from the infantry company. 
The remnants of the company followed behind with an anti-tank gun, another anti-aircraft gun, and the other two companies were in the rear guard. I joined in trailing ranks with two groups of the second company. The laconic order required us to withdraw at precisely 8 p.m., leaving no rear guard in position for cover. Before our retreat, there was again a firefight with rifles and machine guns and heavy machine guns sending tracer bullets into the darkness. As we withdrew, Russian mortar platoons sent sporadic volleys hitting the area left behind us. Their shelling received no response. We walked through the dense forest on a trail that eventually turned north. The advance patrol halted, and I hurried forward. After assessing the situation, we realized that we were surrounded and that there was no time to lose if we wanted to survive. From our position, we could see a village that was swarming with Russians, whose silhouettes flashed against the fires that lit up the whole area with an eerie purple light. I stood next to the 20 millimeter gunner at the edge of the woods, about a hundred meters from the first burning house. Einer had mounted his machine gun on the fender of the vehicle and was preparing to fire. The rest of our group kept behind us, sheltered by the shadow of the forest. After a moment's hesitation, we moved forward, skirting the village from the east, while the flames of the burning huts cast ghostly shadows among the trees. Despite the murmur of the self-propelled anti-aircraft gun's engine, the Russians we had left behind us never spotted us, and we eventually reached a forested swamp. In the diffused light of the field lamp, I discerned that my map showed the northern edge of this swamp, and beyond it an empty quadrant. That is, no information that we needed so badly. Nevertheless, I realized that even this poorly drawn map contained more information than many of our units would have about this area. We walked through the forest until we came to a clearing under the cover of mighty trees. From a small eminence, I looked north and northwest, and about 10 kilometers away, we could make out several rockets hanging silently in the sky. It was the Russian Air Force that had launched them, preparing to approach the target for bombing. There was the front line, and it was also our target. I told the men of our objective, and we moved into the darkness. A fresh summer dawn marked a new day, July 5, 1944. We emerged from the forest as the first morning rays danced across the meadows and wheat fields of a slightly hilly landscape. After some 100 meters of travel, some hill appeared in sight, on which a primitive wooden barn was thundering. Today, together with the advance patrol, I cautiously approached this structure, intending to inform my deputy about our next action. And suddenly, some 30 meters away from us, a Russian major with a pistol in his hand jumped out of the waist-high wheat and shouted in broken germ. Hmm, Kraut, surrender. You are surrounded. Only a moment of silence reigned. Suddenly a line from the machine gun of our field officer cut the Major's chest. Instantly the air was filled with the rumble of gunfire. Russian machine guns were firing at us almost point blank, and we were trying to shoot back while lying in the open. The first 20 millimeter anti-aircraft gun Still hidden in the woods only 100 meters behind us, and unseen by the Russians, opened fire, and its shells whizzed over our heads with a terrible crackling sound. As they burst in the field ahead of us, we could clearly see small puffs of grey smoke. Soon a second 20 millimeter anti-aircraft gun also came into action, and taken by surprise that such overwhelming firepower had suddenly appeared in the midst of their fighting order, the Russians in numbers of about a hundred men fled from us for cover in the ravine. Infantry companies crowded the left and right sides of the road, forcing their way forward through the green shoots of wheat. With anti-aircraft guns and an anti-tank gun in tow rumbling along the road, we were dashing northward. Adding the gravity of our situation, compounded by our limited ammunition, was evident to every member of our group. I shouted over my shoulder to the soldiers hurrying after me. Oh, whoever wants to surrender can stay here. The rest will break through. There was no need to look back to make sure that no one had been left behind as we hurried forward. In the middle of the afternoon, we came to a village situated on a small hill that dominated the neighborhood. Having ruled out the possibility of the village being occupied by the enemy, I prayed to God the place was only a few kilometers from Dune, where our troops should be stationed. 
The village was defended by two obsolete but still formidable T-26 tanks, which emitting puffs of black smoke were choosing a position to meet us with fire from rotating turrets as we approached, showing great skill and bravery. Field Phil Binoff managed to get close and destroy one of them with a shaped charge shell. One of our anti-aircraft guns took a direct hit in the engine, and I ducked near the smoking chassis, while the gunner continued to hammer the enemy with continuous fire. A scarlet rivulet of blood flowed from the sleeve of his tunic. The second Russian tank froze in place, and while its crew tried to leave the vehicle, the tankers fell to the ground under the downpour of fire from our riflemen. We rose from our positions and rushed into the village, screams bursting from our throats as we fired and pelted the houses with grenades. A machine gunner, barely twenty years old, was wounded in the shoulder. Waiting a moment to grab an MG-42, I yelled to him to make his way to the anti-tank gun where he could be taken aboard a self-propelled gun. Shooting from the hip, I rushed ahead of the others and we broke through to the opposite side of the village. We tore forward, leaving burning dwellings behind us, and soon reached the next village. There were no Soviet soldiers visible there, but the inhabitants had already made full preparations to celebrate their liberation by the Red Army and we suddenly found ourselves among them before they could recognize us in our threadbare uniforms and camouflaged helmets. They peered out of the corridors and windows of their dwellings, shouting greetings and waving pieces of white and red cloth. The men prepared to greet their liberators with jugs of sweet cream, and children stood by with wooden spoons. Horrified, they suddenly realized that the aliens armed to the teeth were not Red Army fighters at all, but enemies. Exhausted, hungry, in tattered uniforms, stained with mud and soaked with sweat, we quickly swallowed the food and drink intended for our enemies, paying no attention to the frightened inhabitants. As the sun descended toward the horizon, we moved toward our goal. Suddenly a machine gun burst from our right flank, whistling overhead without harm, and in the distance along the edge of the road we could make out our distinctive helmets of a heavy machine gun crew ducking behind their weapons. With hearts pounding with excitement we cautiously drew closer, shouting to them in German. When we approached them they looked at us with eyes wide with surprise. In trying to fight their way back to their own, the soldiers of the infantry companies had requisitioned or seized the wagons on which we now loaded the machine guns and wounded. Some of the men travelled barefoot, having hung their worn boots on the backs of their horses. The uniforms were all in shreds. White bandages stained red and brown standing out as a vivid testimony to the battles we had been in. The exhausted group reached the location of the colonel who had orders to defend Mioria. He stood in a neat, spotless uniform surrounded by officers from his headquarters near a table at a crossroads of country roads. The tent had been pitched in the back. On my feet, trembling with fatigue, I reported the return of my unit. A large map was spread out on the table, and I tried to show him our escape route. For three days and three nights we had been in constant motion, without a moment's rest, and my eyelids grew heavy as I explained the situation to him on the map. Suddenly, quite unexpectedly, the colonel yelled at me in a way I had not heard since officer's school. I instantly woke up. While he was berating me for my appearance and posture, I could barely restrain myself from throwing the table and the map at him and the surrounding offices, some of whom were glaring at me ominously, while others seemed confused by this outburst of a map. The colonel ended his tirade with a request that if his map was needed to report on our escape route, that I remove my grubby finger from it. I abruptly cut short my report, and without uttering a word, left their amiable company as quickly as possible. I returned to the column of ragged grenadiers standing by the dusty road, and we moved on. In spite of the great sense of relief at being back with our own, we were overwhelmed with longing for our old regiment. We longed so much to be with our family again. We were searching for the road to our unit when we noticed an artillery carriage with the round battle emblem of our division, and we realized in which direction we should step. The next morning, July 6, we set out to guard the front lines in the area of Druya, and during the next few days changed positions to cover a line 10 kilometers long south of Druya. Antonovka, Sosnovka, 
Malinovka. On July 12, we lay low near Krasnogorka on Lake Snudy before rushing south again to strike at the exposed Russian flank. This offensive from July 13 to 19, we targeted Lake Strusto and Dundel near Plusa. On July 12, the regiment was positioned 50 kilometers southwest of Donneberg, in front of an elevation which afforded our enemy excellent opportunities for shelling our troops. I was with the second company in a ravine that was being shot at from nearby Soviet positions. During the daytime, we only had to stick out of the clay holes in which we had burrowed, as we immediately attracted mortar and small arms fire. We repeatedly asked for artillery and assault gun support, for without these reinforcements it was almost impossible to silence the guns that were terrorizing us. We were well aware that even an attempt to do such a thing would lead to disaster. Colonel Sepp Drexel came to our aid with his 436th Regiment. He was given the task of closing the gap between our division and our southern neighbor to the southwest of Plusser. To my soon relief, Uncle Sepp took command of both regiments, and with two assault guns, the experienced commander cut deep into the enemy flank. After this blow, we were able to go in to assault the heights from our lower positions, capture Soviet trenches, and drive far south toward Lake Strusto. This attack provided Army Command with a brief respite during which the right wing of Army Group North, which had fought for the Western Heights in front of Polotsk a few days before, could be withdrawn to a less threatened area. For his initiative and actions taken to stabilize the situation on the southern flank, Colonel Drexel was awarded the Knight's Cross, which he fully deserved. On July 29, we redeployed to Agnista. For a week, we held our position, during which time Captain Schmalfeld was killed and I assumed command of the battalion. We were then ordered to move south and long columns of shabby grenadiers rushed to Stockmanshof on the Divinsky bridgehead. And there we remained, holding a thin line of defense for nearly two weeks until we were moved north again and crossed the Dina on a pontoon bridge. Once across the river, we attacked northward into the Urgly area. On July 20, 1944, Count Klaus von Stauffenberg planted a bomb in the Führer's headquarters in order to eliminate the Brown dictator. The repression resulting from this assassination attempt on the supreme commander of the Wehrmacht and the greatest military leader of all time was felt even on the front lines on the Eastern Front. Since June 30, 1944, our exsanguinated companies have been fighting continuously. It took an hour, a minute or a second to fall asleep, close our eyes and briefly escape the horror. We were exhausted and depleted. The environment was destroying the militia both physically and mentally. The front forced everyone to fight for survival every minute. And then, on top of the disasters and losses we were experiencing, came the news of an assassination attempt. Mere words cannot express the thoughts we had at the news of the attempt on Hitler's life. For years we continued to fight desperately for the fate of our homes and our families. But as rumors of the true situation on the home front began to multiply along with the exhortations of political leaders away from the guns, we began to question more and more the integrity of our leadership in Berlin. Painfully, we began to realize that our sacrifices, our years of constant exposure to suffering, deprivation and death had left these leaders indifferent and insensitive to everything, but what benefited and enriched them personally. We began to pray to heaven to put an end to this devastating conflagration into which so many millions of people had been plunged. A week later, I learned from the advanced observers of the artillery regiment that the Phil Gendarmieri had arrested General Lindemann's son. He was in an artillery regiment in the 132nd Infantry Division, and when the news of the assassination attempt on Hitler was announced, someone overheard him as if to say, Too bad he's not killed. And he was denounced by one of his own soldiers. It was confirmed that our former commander, General Lindemann, was a member of the resistance group, and it is quite possible that the arrest of his son was the result of the so-called family responsibility, which was so zealously and ruthlessly enforced and carried out by the party clique. General Indeman was an officer of the old school, a splendid military leader characterized by typical aristocratic manners. As division commander, he endeavored with all his might to achieve that the troops 
should be provided with the greatest possible care, and he displayed the most perfect professionalism during the offensive at Theodosia, Kerch, and Sevastopol. He always strove to ensure that the artillery, the Luftwaffe and all means of combat support were organized and operated as efficiently as possible to reduce casualties. Several times during the fighting at Gaitolov, he risked his reputation and career by insisting, after careful study of the situation, that the offensive should be delayed or postponed while encountering strong opposition from the high command. This may have cost General Lindemann the loss of prestige in Berlin but such measures definitely reduced the magnitude of the losses that might have occurred with equally successful results. Also under his command, a massive Soviet offensive at Smedinja and near Lake Ladoga was repulsed. And now we are told that General Lindemann was a member of a resistance group. From this moment on, all reasons for self-sacrifice, for loyalty to the motherland and to the National Socialist government all motives that inspired us to make sacrifices at the front are forever questioned. This fact alone told us more than any other that this war was lost. The realization that an entire group of our most talented and proven military commanders had tried to assassinate our head of state, albeit a brutal one, proved to us that militarily we were unable to defeat the vast combined might of the Allies, the only thing that made us fight even harder was the realization that our Soviet enemy, should he invade our fatherland, would show no adherence to the unwritten laws of humanity and humanity. Another result of the attempt on the Fuhrer's life was that, despite all efforts to exonerate him, Hitler, once the idol of millions, had become in the eyes of many nothing less than a dictator in brown, capable of taking any cruel, sadistic measures against his political opponents. Among his victims were our own field commanders, to whom we entrusted our lives and who controlled our destiny. In the eyes of the soldiers, Hitler's aura was destroyed. The explosive planted by Colonel Count von Stauffenberg did not kill the dictator, but it did undermine, if not destroy, the deification that had been so carefully planted and nurtured by the authorities in our youth. For some time there was an institution of political officers made up of national socialists attached to military units. In the preceding years and months, they had been taken seriously by the soldiers at the front. At first they were usually experienced, reliable war veterans who, because of severe wounds, were no longer physically able to serve in the troops. However, as the military fortune began to turn away from us, it became obvious to us that they were becoming more and more like their colleagues in the Red Army, and the soldiers began to call them politrooks among themselves. After the assassination attempt on July 20, the form of the military salute was changed. Henceforth, the universally recognized traditional greeting, putting your hand to the visor of the cap or the rim of the steel helmet was forbidden. The highest in rank in our country, Rhys Marshal Hermann Goering considered more suitable for the manifestation of loyalty of the Wehrmacht to the ruling system greeting the Nazi party. This party salute, that is, the raising forward of the right outstretched arm, was viewed with displeasure and contempt by soldiers who respected military traditions, and this order was taken as an insult by those who valued high standards and character. Indeed, in the eyes of the soldiers, the compulsory use of this salute served to unite them with those exalted members of the party who had developed the talents to sit back at home during war team, and such a salute epitomized those for whom such contempt was now felt. Even before the order, such a salute was considered ridiculous and impractical in a military environment. After the order, it was not uncommon to see whole companies carrying bowler hats in the right hand to avoid the forced demonstration of their loyalty to the party. Our anxieties about the event of the assassination attempt in relation to the situation at the front were short-lived. The ordinary soldier at the front was so immersed in the problems of his own survival that he had little time to think about the consequences of the assassination attempt. In later years, among friends, we told each other that not one of us shed a tear about it. All sympathy for politicians, no matter what the situation, had dried up during the years of hardship and suffering at the front and in the endless years and months of captivity that followed. Above all, however, we were bound by the oath we had taken as German soldiers 
we swore to defend our country with arms even at the cost of our lives, and even a change of command or policy could not release us from this oath. An assassination attempt was not necessarily regarded by the soldier as an act of treachery. For in the natural course of events at the front, we began to identify our loyalty with ourselves and thus made a distinction between the armed forces and the brown-shirted leadership in Berlin. Fifteen years later, I learned the story of the death of our general, who in my opinion was an exceptionally brave and talented division commander, a fine officer and an unforgettable leader in the recollections of those who knew him and served under him. A description of what happened to him was kindly provided to me by his son and widow, who received this information in a letter from Dr. Charlotte Pommer of the State Hospital in Berlin. The general was hiding in the house of an architect in Berlin, an act for which both this man and his wife paid with their lives. The Reich government announced a reward of 500,000 Reichsmarks for information that would allow him to be caught, and the Gestapo set off in pursuit. According to former German Red Cross nurse, Gertrude Lux, General Lindemann was shot by a Gestapo officer who took him to the State Police Hospital at Berlin, nahe 40 Scharnhorststrasse, on September 3, 1944. This supper officer wore a ring with the initials A.T. or T.A. She was told that these security officers, on duty under the direction of criminal police counsellor Zard, entered the house on Rex Kanzlerplatz, where General Lindemann was hiding. After their arrival, the general managed to lock himself in a room on the top floor, and then he attempted to climb out of a window onto the roof. The Gestapo man managed to dislodge some of the planks of the door, and he managed to fire two shots at the figure trying to escape through the window. And then the general apparently collapsed, and when the Gestapo man asked him if he was wounded, Lindem, yes, twice, I believe, at 2.30 p.m., the general was taken to the hospital with a bullet wound to the abdomen and flesh. The hospital staff was instructed to attend to the treatment of the wounds he had received during the arrest, and the patient's care was strictly classified with consequences. While preparations were being made to treat the wounds he had received during his arrest, he was placed on a stool and then placed on an operating table, to which his right arm was strapped. He asked for this arm to be bandaged but it was explained to him that this was a normal precautionary measure taken prior to surgery. An anaesthetic was then administered intravenously, and falling into unconsciousness, the general said in a loud voice, I am General Lindemann, I am innocent, I am dying for Germany. Please tell my wife. During the operation, which lasted one hour and forty minutes, it was discovered that the colon had been shot twice and this led to infection, which caused inflammation of the internal organs. The wound in the flesh of the upper thigh was also attended to. After the operation, he was placed in room 116 of the surgical ward, near which two Gestapo men were constantly stationed for security. While he was still under anesthesia, both his hands were tied to the edges of the bed. It was agreed that the investigation would be carried out when his condition allowed it, and he had the strength to endure the interrogation. The next day the patient's condition improved considerably. Night nurse Gertrude Lux explained to the SD staff that as long as the patient's hands were tied he could not be given proper care, and she succeeded in persuading them to release the knots for the morning and evening washings, which lasted about an hour and a half. On September 4, an attempt was made through Fro Alexandra Roloff and Dr. Maria Dialen to notify the relatives of the patient's condition. On September 5, the bonds were removed from his wrists, and on post-operative examination it was found that peritonitis had set in, for which it was not advisable to arrange any immediate interrogation. Despite the severity of his wound, his circulation and blood pressure remained relatively acceptable. During the many air raid warnings that plagued Berlin during that period, he was moved from his ward to the operating bunker, and he noticed that the SD officer was trying hard and always to put him in the safest place possible, perhaps for the safety of both the SD staff and the general himself. To once, when the SD guard had left him in the care of a nurse for a moment to get some rest, General Lindemann asked, Sister Gertrude, what is the situation at the front?
In view of recent events, the nurse did not know how she should answer this delicate question, and, hesitating, asked, Don't you know what happened to you? Of course I know, but it doesn't matter because so many people are dying, he replied. On another occasion he thanked her for her concern for him and mentioned that he had two sons at the front. Local peritonitis developed into a generalized infection of the abdomen, and the general's condition began to deteriorate. On September 11, a blood transfusion was scheduled. At noon that day, someone called the Gestapo staff and warned them that a plan might be underway to free the general. For the next few days, the SD employees slept with loaded pistols placed next to them on the night table. On September 13, Professor Hoach, chief surgeon of the state hospital, examined a patient in the surgical ward. When he introduced himself, General Lindemann simply closed his eyes and made no reply. The professor opened the wound and removed the tumour without the use of anaesthesia. The general did not say a word or make a sound both during and after the examination. Having completed the examination, Professor Hotch contacted criminal police counsellor Zard by telephone and explained to the latter that the condition of the patient was very serious and that an interrogation had to be conducted as soon as possible if the police wished to obtain any information at all from the general. After this conversation, Dr. Charlotte Palmer contacted Dr. Teets, the director of the internal department of the hospital. It was decided that instead of the patient being routinely injected all night with medication to improve blood circulation, he would be given a large dose of pantopone. This decision was never carried out, because about half an hour later, the Gestapo showed up and interrogated the general for about two hours. On the evening of September 13, the news of his arrest was broadcast over the radio network, and the next morning a report of the incident first appeared in the newspapers. On September 21, in the afternoon of September 21, he was again interrogated for a short time, and that evening his condition deteriorated dramatically. At about 3.00 a.m. on September 22, his blood pressure dropped, and about two hours and fifteen minutes later he lost consciousness and never woke up. During interrogations, and while in the hospital under guard, he never showed outward signs of physical pain. After his death, his body was taken away by the Gestapo, and his final resting place remains unknown. Final Retreat In July and August, despite our lack of formal training in this art form, we became masters of withdrawal and retreat. The old soldiers played the role of the battalion's backbone. Divided into small fighting groups, we no longer belonged, as before, to our own division, but were constantly moving from one unit to another, and outwardly this seemed hardly planned or organized. We began to rely for the most part on our own resourcefulness for supply and support, and realized that any situation was capable of sudden change. Previously, when a unit took up new positions, the organization of normal supply and support had been an obligatory thing, which included the setting up of guns and the delivery of food rations to all troops, as well as an elaborate plan for the care of the wounded. With the breakdown of the normal battle order, such systematic planning was no longer possible, and we increasingly had to worry about ourselves without expecting or relying on support from the high command. We established a responsive, confident intelligence network that kept us informed of the general state of affairs at the front. On a large scale, the absence of mail for long periods was a sure sign that another major disaster had occurred. From our front positions, it was not always possible to make out what was happening a few kilometers away. But the Grenadiers, those battle-hardened veterans, were quick to assess the situation around them and instinctively guessed at impending trouble. At a distance we could hear the heavy artillery cannonade as the enemy prepared to strike at some part of the front, and by the distant gunfire and the familiar sounds of rumbling engines and rumbling tractors associated with heavy equipment, we could determine that a breakthrough was being made on our right or left, and thus gain a few precious minutes to make hasty preparations for withdrawal, although the order to do so would inevitably come at the last possible moment. In the early morning hours I arrived at our new defensive position in the vicinity of Donneberg and set about setting up the defensive line and instructing the remnants of the battle group. 
and I battalion, 437th Regiment. With me were several non-commissioned officers and non-commissioned officers. A few hundred metres behind our position, we found a depot where a supply field officer was guarding large supplies of provisions that had not yet had time to be moved farther to the rear. We asked him if we could get something for the grenadiers, and as if by accident we hinted that in a few hours this very spot would become a forward line, and added that in our experience the first mines would begin to fall here about noon. He replied that he was ready to open the storehouse to us with all his heart, if there was still time to distribute all the cash to the fighting units, but added that he had been ordered to await transportation to evacuate what he admitted to be a huge stock of flour, liquor and cigarettes. I immediately reported the situation to the battle group headquarters and asked for instructions regarding the warehouse, but received nothing in reply. Meanwhile, our second company began to arrive, intending to take up positions in front of the depot, and rumours spread like fire among the soldiers about the treasure awaiting its fate. The commander of the second company appeared, surrounded by his grenadiers. While the field fable intendant evaded a direct answer and hesitated, platoons of infantry men in faded, threadbare uniforms and battered camouflage, helmets covering their unshaven, sunburned faces began to approach. Coming up were grey-green columns of soldiers, battle-weary, with grenades on their belts, automatic rifles dangling from their hips. And here came the machine gunners with long, sunshiny 7.92 caliber cartridge belts and Faust patrons slung over their shoulders. Suddenly the field flable seemed to realize the perfect gravity of the situation. The front was coming at him. He immediately jumped into his car and disappeared toward the rear in clouds of dust, throwing the storehouse and all its contents upon us. Race carts were quickly found and the soldiers of the machine gun company entered the storehouse to begin evacuating the supplies. Cigarettes, food and drink were brought out in great quantities, and all were spread out on the roadside for the soldiers of other units to fend for themselves as they passed by. Most of the supplies were distributed before the end of the day, when the depot came under the inevitable fire from Russian artillery batteries and was eventually destroyed. Over the next few days, F.C., Hogan Adel, my former commanding officer during the recruit period, destroyed his 9th Soviet tank in close combat while commanding a platoon in the 14th Anti-Tank Company. At the end of the day, he was ordered to take three men with Faust patrons on a road trip by car. This road marked, as it were, the dividing line between them and the neighbouring division, and we had the task of blocking this way for enemy tanks that might try to use it. About halfway to the intended point, they came across a large group of infantrymen of the neighbouring division, retreating in the direction of the rear, and they warned the grenadiers that it is impossible to go further, because the column of Russian tanks is approaching. Taking this warning into account, the soldiers began to look for a good position, when suddenly the gearbox of the truck failed. Taking two men with him, Godinado went forward on foot, around a bend in the road, they suddenly found themselves facing several Russian tanks a few hundred meters away. In the evening half-darkness, the sergeant could see that the armor of the tanks were full of heavily armed infantrymen, and the grenadiers immediately dived into the roadside ditch, praying to God that they would not be noticed. When the column got closer, a sergeant with a fast patron on his shoulder took careful aim at the first tank and achieved a direct hit. The entire column instantly stopped, and the infantrymen jumped from the tanks and rushed into the dense undergrowth about twenty paces from the ambush where Goganadel lurked, and Goganadel opened fire on the group of Russians with his automatic rifle. The almost point-blank fire that the Russians suddenly found themselves under, combined with the thickening darkness, created brief chaos in the enemy ranks. They began to shoot back. But in the darkness, the anti-tank group ran across to the other side of the road where other soldiers were waiting for them, and the hand grenades thrown by the Russians exploded without any damage in the place abandoned seconds earlier. The grenadiers quickly changed positions again and dived for cover in a roadside ditch. A few seconds later the column moved forward again, and the men were ordered to let the first two tanks pass and fire on the third. For several minutes the rumble of the approaching column was heard, 
and as the enemy tanks approached, one of our soldiers fired a false patron and hit the lead tank, which was immediately engulfed in flames. The rest of the tanks rolled back and began to stay away, and there were still many infantry with them. Many times inferior to the enemy in numbers, Gogan Idol's group nevertheless opened fire with machine guns and rifles and jumped out on the road, and the Russians fled in panic, despite their overwhelming advantage over the Grenadiers. Meanwhile, the soldiers heard the noise of more tanks coming at them, which were about 100 metres from their positions, and the next tank they spotted in the glow of the fire on the tank that had already been hit was from the Stalin series, a 64-ton colossus that materialised out of the cover of night. Once more the false patron fired, and to the soldiers' horror, the shells struck the tank but failed to penetrate the armour. Fortunately, this tank stopped, backed up and retreated into the darkness. Gojanadel went after it, keeping close, with his false patron at the ready, noticing that after the first hit the infantry had abandoned it. When he got within a few metres of the enemy vehicle, he fired the false patron at point-blank range. The shell pierced the thick steel and caused an explosion inside the tank. It quickly caught fire and soon the fuel tank and shells inside the tank exploded. Several of our infantrymen arrived to reinforce this group, and it held the road until the next morning. This gave ample time for the sappers to destroy an important bridge behind this tiny unit, and by this the enemy attempt to drive a wedge between our two divisions along this road was thwarted. Midsummer 1944, during the battle south of Drissa Druzha, we attempted to link up with the 3rd Tank Army of Army Group Centre in a blow that put us 30 kilometres beyond the Divina River. Despite all efforts, this attempt failed. July 10, between Army Group North and defeated Army Group Centre, there was a gap 25 kilometres wide. In the Boberis Cauldron, the Red Army destroyed 20 German divisions. This disaster is comparable only to the defeat of the 6th Army in Stalingrad. But the German propaganda machine almost did not mention the terrible disaster, trying to convince the population that this shameful defeat is actually even a kind of victory, although the enemy offensive on the Eastern Front killed thousands of German soldiers. Having won this great victory over Army Group Center, the Soviet Army made a triumphant march to Moscow. Later, while imprisoned as a prisoner of war, I met some of the soldiers who witnessed this rout, who survived and subsequently endured the march to confinement, the German soldiers. Those who managed to stay alive after surrendering were transported to Moscow. On this long journey, many died of thirst and exhaustion or unable to walk due to wounds or disease, were shot in Massey at the places where they had fallen during the endless march. Eventually, the prisoners were rounded up in large camps near Moscow in preparation for the victorious march. To add strength to the starving prisoners after their harsh ordeal, they were fed fatty soup, which they greedily devoured. Then they were forced to march in columns of 24 in a row through Moscow. They marched past Soviet generals standing on bleachers for spectators, while the city's population lined the streets by the thousands. Allied embassy representatives and dignitaries were present as guests of honour, and the victory march was caught on film by journalists from all over the world. After weeks of deprivation, the digestive systems of the prisoners of war could not cope with the diet they had been given in recent days, and as they marched through the city, the battered columns suffered an acute attack of dysentery that forced them to defecate even more severely than usual. Dozens of prisoners of war were unable to control their stomachs during the victory parade, and a movie was later released in the United States showing the excrement of Nazi invaders being washed off the streets of Moscow as an example of the agony of defeat. In ancient times, it was a general rule for victors to drive their captives through Rome or Carthage. The captives became slaves of the victors, but nevertheless there was often a semblance of protection for them through laws and basic rights. In the 12th century, captives often enjoyed little or no protection and were completely dependent on the mood of the victors. They could be beaten, forced to labour to death or simply starve to death. Among those who fought in the East, there was a generally recognised opinion that it was better to die on the battlefield 
than to suffer an unknown fate in a Soviet POW camp. This mentality was often reflected in the many acts of courage displayed by individual soldiers and entire units. In the final days of the war, it was not uncommon for entire companies, battalions and combat groups to fight to the last man, and the survivors were captured only when there was no ammunition left and their wounds were too severe to continue further resistance. In July, a powerful group of 29 Russian infantry divisions and tank corps of the 1st Baltic and 3rd Belarusian fronts broke through a gap in the defences of Army Group Centre and headed west to the Baltic Sea. After this breakthrough, the fate of Army Group North, consisting of 23 German divisions, was sealed. These doomed, isolated and completely cut off from Germany. The divisions were later renamed Army Group Kurland and held on, despite the huge disparity, until the last end. In July 1944, the Army Group's front in the south ran west from Shokolin to Mitava. The Soviets succeeded in breaking this line with a force of 20 divisions, and on July 29 they appeared at Tukkum, and thus reached the Baltic Sea coast. Although the German divisions fought desperately at Aknist, at the Dinsk bridgehead at Stokmanshoff and in the Ergli area, they still found themselves cut off from the only possible land road to Germany. In August, General Count Strachwitz, with the help of his tank group, attempted to retake Tukkum, which was behind us. On August 20, he succeeded in capturing this strategically important section, and for a while we were able to breathe easier. This victory was considered a stunning achievement, not only for Count Strachwitz and his tankers, but also for the sailors of the cruiser Prince Eugen and its accompanying destroyers and torpedo boats, which fired from the sea Russian positions in Tuk. On August 21 and 22, we attacked the town of Ergli with the weakened I battalion of the 437th Regiment. At the banks of the Ogre River, we captured forward positions and attacked the Russians through the Ergli Cemetery. Caught under mortar and artillery fire, we hid between graves while shrapnel hissed against the stone tombstones beside which we lay low. Realising that to remain in this place was tantamount to waiting for imminent death or injury, Follett and I fired on the run with assault rifles as we and the battalion headquarters advanced under fire. A short distance ahead of us, there was a shrubbery where there seemed to be some shelter, and I was zigzagging between the memorial slabs toward the shelter, when suddenly a few feet away, I was astonished to see a pair of wide-open eyes staring at me from beneath a round Russian helmet. Our gazes must have been fixed on each other for ages. Instinctively, I managed to shout stop, and the Russian sergeant's machine gun clinked at my feet. Solit, who was a few meters away from me, quickly tossed the grenade that had fallen beside him into the bushes and seized some Russian soldier who was trudging forward, stumbling and holding his hands above his head. A hasty examination of the place revealed that the sergeant had a field telephone hidden in the bushes, and junior Ephraim and Triber from the battalion headquarters took it for himself. But before that he contacted the Soviet unit at the other end of the wire and shouted into the receiver. Yes, the Krauts are here. The telephone wire disappeared into the undergrowth, giving us a direction in which we were to advance. The Russian sergeant was directing mortar and artillery fire that threatened to disrupt our attack, and after his capture his unit could no longer receive information about our movements and location. We called for 80mm mortar fire, as well as the 150mm guns of the 13th Artillery Battery, on the dominant elevation southeast of Ergli, and under cover of this fire attacked the hill with a force of 50 men. Follett, a former artilleryman who'd served in the Crimea with the 132nd Artillery Regiment, established communication between our position and our two divisional batteries, which had posted behind Ergli during the night. To hold the heights under the onslaught of a superior enemy, we developed a new but dangerous tactic. With only weak reinforcements, it was obvious that we could not hold our lines without reliable artillery support. During the night, we placed two machine gun nests in front of the crest of the hill. As soon as it began to get light, we abandoned these positions, withdrawing the soldiers to the back slope of the hill, about 200 meters below the crest. As expected, the Soviets followed our retreating units, 
and as soon as we noticed the first Russian helmets appearing on the crest of the hill, I ordered 150mm shells to be fired directly our former positions. Such a fire raid invariably brought success, and we drove the enemy back to his trenches, and at evening light we retook those positions. In this way we were able to hold our position on Egg Heights in front of Ergley for about two weeks. In the last days of August, Lieutenant Steinhardt arrived with 80 soldiers from the Luftwaffe to reinforce the battalion. They were attached to the 438th Grenadier Regiment and quickly became accustomed to their new role as infantrymen, proving themselves to be reliable and brave fighters. During this entire period, we maintained excellent relations with the regimental commander, Colonel Zertz, and his adjutant, Captain von Daimling. In the closing days of August, we were taken to the rear of the regimental reserve to some old estate near Ergley. After a long period of fighting, we finally found ourselves back with our old regiment. It was now commanded by one of the old rubes from the 436th Regiment, Major Osner. He had heard about our defence of the egg height and drove up to us when we, together with 120 soldiers from the battalion, were lying resting in the churchyard in Ergley. He greeted me warmly, put his arm around my shoulders, and we briefly reminisced about the old days when we served together in our regiment. It was not said aloud, but we both realised very well that in all probability we were approaching our last and decisive battle. Speaking of how many of our comrades were already buried in the Russian soil, he stopped talking to get a better look at the emaciated, unwashed survivors lying on the ground, exhausted, and with tears in the corners of his eyes, he suddenly turned away and walked away. During the raids, the rear personnel were driven in increasing numbers into the infantry. Luftwaffe soldiers, still in their blue-grey uniforms and without a single day of training as infantrymen, undergoing hasty instruction in the use of automatic weapons, arrived at our place, completely unprepared to confront the ever-gaining strength of the enemy. For those in the rear, far from Russian guns, the phrase transfer to infantry took on a new, ominous meaning. It's the threat of service on the front line, where mines and artillery shells are bursting, where snipers consider killing a careless man a useful but deadly sport, and where people kill each other almost at arm's length. All this was enough to make the blood run cold in the veins of many rear guards. The phrase punitive transfer was heard more and more often in the troops. The term was regarded with disgust and contempt by old infantry veterans and those who had survived many battles, and its use as punishment for rash or real misconduct created ill feelings between battalion veterans and those soldiers who were transferred to us for disciplinary reasons. Old infantrymen wondered, are the years spent on the front lines, the hardships endured and the horrors endured considered nothing more than a disciplinary measure? In particular, there was a certain colonel general whose highly prized patch of rank, in the view of those who had personally encountered his distinctive leadership style, could only have come about because of the Gold Party badge he wore and his philosophy in which he placed the National Socialist Party above his loyalty to the troops whose lives were entrusted to him. Colonel General Scherner had made it a practice to punish soldiers, non-commissioned officers and officers, by immediately transferring them to the infantry for the slightest infraction. Everyone agreed that this high-ranking gentleman clearly did not understand anything about the code of honour that existed in the German infantry. By sending the guilty to the infantry as punishment, he contributed to the decline of the soldier's willingness to sacrifice himself for what was presented to him as right and just. One evening a certain field fell trained as a gunner, reported to me from battalion headquarters for duty. He informed me that he had arrived by order of the Colonel General, had been demoted and sent to the front line. The next day we received the punishment report, neatly printed as an official document on Army Group North letterhead, signed by the Colonel General, a large-sized S as the capital letter of the surname Scherner. This well-trained soldier was by profession a master of precision instruments, had studied at the Army Armory School, and as such could be considered an indispensable asset to his battalion. But, as he explained, the Colonel General was not interested in how the battalion would go about repairing its machine guns and rifles. But that discipline must be maintained, 
and that infractions must be severely punished. This very infraction occurred when this field fell bell was on the road to the rear depot to get urgently needed spare parts for Hewnett's weapons. He was riding in the back of a regimental motor car when he noticed some high-ranking general at a crossroads, and, as was his custom, jumped off the car to give his report. With his left hand, he took the pipe out of his mouth and held it pressed to his side as he saluted. He could not put the pipe in his tunic pocket, for it was unsmoked and would have burned his uniform. When he saluted, the general demanded to see what object he was holding in his hand. The field officer showed the officer with the crimson and gold patch on his collar, his pipe, and he was ordered to throw it away immediately. Then the Feldfebel obediently tapped the pipe against the sole of his boot and quickly slipped it into his uniform pocket. Such an action would have been quite calmly accepted by any reasonable officer. For this serious misdemeanor he was to be punished. For several days he was at the battalion headquarters, where he found something to do, repairing and renewing the weapons damaged in the battles. Almost a week later I was visited by some one-armed staff officer who had suddenly appeared at our headquarters. This lieutenant had been given the unenviable task of finding out if the soldier involved in the incident was really serving his due punishment, and here for the first time in my military service I made a false report. This man was killed in action two days ago. The officer disappeared after that, and I have never regretted the lie I committed. It is the duty of every officer to look after the welfare of his soldiers, and I believe that the skill of a field officer and his ability to keep our guns in the best fighting condition in war was far more valuable than mere obedience to this absurd order. During the last few weeks the division has been withdrawn behind the Russian Baltic frontier, and once more the European soil is beneath our feet. This territory had for centuries served as a geographical buffer between Central and Northern Europe, and between East and West, to the casual observer. This faintly undulating terrain seemed to have a peaceful atmosphere. The hilltops were crowned with sparse pine, maple, and oak trees. Shallow valleys were covered with grass, damp peat bogs and small lakes surrounded by birch trees. The area was dotted with small, swift streams flowing to the Dina, which in turn flows into the Baltic Sea near Riga. The population was mostly engaged in agriculture or forestry. The land here is fertile and the climate is comparatively mild for Eastern Europe. Cattle, pigs and sheep are raised in abundance, and people live in wooden houses with large rooms, baths and sturdily built animal barns, spacious. Well-made cellars are usually built close to the houses. During the fighting in the areas of Stockmanshof, Aknist and Ergli and from Riga to Courland, we used cellars, whenever possible, for battalion and company headquarters. The local estates, somewhat smaller in size than their Prussian neighbours to the west, are scattered over the terrain, and the villages are located along primitive roads that were created more for horse-drawn wagons than for motor vehicles. Although the farms and villages bear the distinctive characteristics of Eastern architecture, the larger structures in towns and cities have a decidedly Gothic character. The towns have churches and public buildings of the lower Germanic Baroque style of the Middle Ages. The peaceful landscape with its clean houses, villages and towns reminded us of our own homeland to the extent that it was even a little easier to bear the present situation being cut off and isolated from our usual family circle and familiar surroundings. The field kitchens welcomed arrivals of fresh vegetables, young potatoes and pork, and the supply officers and company field officers were busily trying to improve their reputations by competing with each other to see who could best supply the soldiers at the front. In the last days of August, battalions and regiments of the 132nd Infantry Division fought west of Madoni, and near Ergli against an enemy far superior in manpower and equipment. After these heavy battles, the 437th Grenadier Regiment had to be disbanded because of the huge losses and with no hope of replenishment. On September 14, the last commander of the 437th Regiment, Major Oxner, Knight's Cross, was killed in battle near Ergli. He had been wounded no less than eight times during the war in Russia, 
and before he could recover from his most recent wounds, he met his fate on the battlefield. Early in September, Captain Deedle took command of the battalion. He was a true Bavarian with a sense of humour and an athletically built man. He was known for his short pipe, which he called his nosegay. I remained attached to headquarters, acting as battalion adjutant, and Follett was the supply officer. Our medical officer was Gerd Piner, and the machine gun company was commanded by Captain Fred Fuchius, who we nicknamed Per Gunt. The few survivors of the friends of our old circle became inseparable, and only wounds or death could break the bonds of our comradeship. It must be said that this was the only positive aspect we experienced during our total war. When the 437th Regiment was disbanded, its units were transferred to headquarters, the 13th Infantry Company, the 14th Anti-Tank Company of the 436th Grenadier Regiment, and the 438th Infantry Regiment. Only one Grenadier Battalion remained intact and was allowed to carry the name I.E. Grenadier Battalion of the 437th Infantry Regiment although it had already been attached to the 436th Infantry Regiment. Those of us who belonged to the 437th were proud to continue to carry the old numerical name of the regiment. The commander of the 436th Regiment, Colonel Sepp Drexel, Knight's Cross commander, was one of the few commanders who had been through both world wars and survived. He had an impeccable reputation for absolute fairness and loyalty, which he constantly demonstrated in front of his troops. He was a commander with the rare talent of knowing when the situation called for strict discipline and when something could be allowed. The troops called him, in a friendly way, Papa Drexel, and those who were on closer terms with him often allowed themselves to call him Uncle Zap. The rookie officers and soldiers immediately developed an excellent rapport with him. Once again, we narrowly escaped disaster. On September 14, enemy forces with strong support of tanks broke through on our right flank. They tore forward and on September 16 bypassed Ergley, thus cutting us off from the main forces on the field. After this serious event, it was no longer possible to hold our positions, so we again broke through the encirclement and occupied the heights west of Ergley, and these positions we held for several days. The leaves on the trees began to take on the colours of autumn. In long columns we marched westward on cobblestone roads, taking territory further west, as our retreat was jokingly called by the gallows humour of the soldiers. Despite the losses we suffered in breaking through the Soviet encirclement ring that had recently closed around us, we continued our organised retreat, approaching the sea, from which further withdrawal was no longer possible. Far to the north at the end of September, the Russians began their offensive between Narva and Pleskov. This offensive caused the withdrawal of all German troops north of the Divina, and the plan for the evacuation of Riga was set in motion. A long campaign began, marking our final retreat into Courland. Riga is the ancient capital of the Order of Hanseatic Knights. We had to accept the dubious reward of seeing the once beautiful city behind us, now in its death throes. Primitive roads were clogged with dusty columns of trucks and tanks. Day and night, refugees with endless carts and handcarts, full of their belongings, marched through the Latvian capital. The air was filled with the roar of tired and maddened herds of cattle being driven westward along the cobblestone streets of Riga. The ominous appearance of the Russian attack planes became a permanent feature of our eerie situation as they rumbled over tiled roofs displaying a clear five-pointed red star on their silver-gleaming fuselages. The fall of 1944 brought winds, rain and cold nights. As was often the case wherever we fought, many roads once again became impassable quagmires. Exhausted, constantly hungry and always freezing, the soldiers moved like machines from one position to another line of defence. The only respite from the enemy's pursuit came at sunset, when the creeping darkness sheltered us from the watchful eyes of death. Enemy troops, who quickly occupied our positions after the withdrawal, filled the void, passing through towns and villages in innumerable clouds. Maps of soldiers, tightly seated on the armour of giant tanks T-34, raging artillery and planes flying at a breakneck speed rolled into our next line of defence. 
and again we stopped and turned to face our tireless pursuers. October 1944 Operation Thunder The last withdrawal of German troops to Kurland and the evacuation of Riga was carefully planned by the headquarters of Army Group North. At the beginning of October 1944, Major General von Natzmer signed an order to regroup the German troops remaining in the Baltic region on the last battlefield. On October 5, Operation Thunder began. When it was underway, the 132nd Infantry Division held its positions southeast of Riga. Beginning on October 6, behind us, the entire army pulled westward and moved in columns through the city and across the bridges over the Gina River. The army group was able to hold only a narrow corridor 45 kilometers long and 6 kilometers wide between Riga and Schlock, which was the only passage to Courland. All refugees and military units retreating before the Red Hordes were forced to cross the Vina and AA on this piece of territory, as through formation two divisions had to pass daily, and a mishmash of different military units across a narrow strip of land that was within range of Soviet artillery firing from closed positions, beginning in the first days of October. This operation was a masterpiece in terms of planning and organization, and the planning was done by the talented Major General Frank Hewitz of the 215th Infantry Division. His units assigned a thousand officers and soldiers to organize and command the columns that slowly but methodically made their way to Carland. Several officers from the reserve were attached to maintain control during the evacuation, and Gussel Hickel told me later that strict measures were taken to regulate traffic and save as many lives as possible. All vehicles, whether their passengers were high-ranking staff officers or shabby soldiers, if they stopped on the road because of air or artillery fire or simply because of lack of fuel, were unceremoniously thrown off the road and drowned in the swamps that bordered the roadsides. Any abandoned military equipment was destroyed to prevent the enemy from using it, and wagons loaded to the top with wounded mixed with civilian refugees. The wreckage of war slowly creaked toward the sea in a hopeless attempt to elude the Red Army. The cold and gloomy night of October 1213 descended on the soldiers occupying machine gun and rifle positions in the suburbs of Riga. When the drizzling rain began, the last infantrymen of our battalions, who had the dubious honour of being in the rear guard, marched through the burning city. On the approach to the big bridge over the Divina River, General Wagner, commander of the 132nd Infantry Division, stood silently with Papa Drexel. They watched the columns in grey field uniforms pass by without a word to the measured clatter of worn boots on cobblestones, interrupted only by the occasional clang of a machine gun against a bowler or a helmet hanging from a sturdy leather belt. Glimmers of flame danced in the black sky, soaring over the opera house in the centre of the city, casting grim shadows on the grey columns striding across the ancient bridge as the once victorious army retreated, shattered into pieces. At exactly zeros, 30 my column approached the Divinsky Bridge, spanning a river that seemed black and repulsive in the night, being at the head of these soldiers entrusted to me to guard the battalion's withdrawal. I knew that we represented the last German Wehrmacht force to cross the Divine at Riga from east to west. As I approached the two lone figures whose vague silhouettes were visible on the bridge against the flickering light of the dying city, I stopped and saluted. After a brief pause, during which we looked at the uneven column passing us, the last general, major, and lieutenant crossed to the other side, it suddenly came to me that on this very spot twenty-five years ago stood Schlageter with his cannon, in a noble struggle to prevent the Red Revolution from sweeping through ancient Ordensland. At Fimesyslo, with the dawn came a damp and cold day. As the sun broke through the dense grey horizon, an officer from the bomb squad turned the handle of the blasting machine connected to the explosive charges in the Divinsky Bridge. A giant fireball rose into the sky above the river, and a colossal explosion erupted, from which the bridge finally collapsed into the Vina River, cutting us off from the Soviet army once again. Days about a hundred meters away, the ferry with the last remnants of the rearguard crossed the river and docked at the shore. As the bridge rumbled down into the swift river current, large chunks of stone rained down on the vessel 
striking and seriously wounding the retreating soldiers. Thus Operation Thunder came to its ominous end. We reached our new and final battlefield, Courland, for three and a half years, almost without respite, the 132nd Infantry, Division confronted the enemy on the Eastern Front. This last front was not only the geographical location of our last resistance to a superior enemy, but it was also the final culmination of our fighting. While our homeland in the distance crumbled in fire and death during these final months of the war, Army Group Kurland continued to hold the lines, albeit steadily weakened by casualties. There was a shortage of ammunition. Our artillery batteries were allowed to expend only a limited amount of shells per day. Machine guns were allowed to fire only in short bursts. A whole machine gun belt was allowed to be expended only when an attack was repulsed. Our newest rifles, newly created and delivered to the troops in the last months of the war, were sometimes useless if they ran out of ammunition. Often soldiers had to rely on carefully camouflaged weapons catches set up just in case. This system applied not only to ammunition, but also to fuel and food. Stockpiling drivers always kept a few carefully stashed jerry cans of fuel in reserve. An extra sack of barley or dried rhubarb was always set aside for the horses. More and more often our supply lines were interrupted. Sometimes the movement of entire companies depended on the frugality of individual soldiers. In horse-drawn units, serious attention was always paid to the condition of the animals. All reports required the condition of both horses and soldiers. As with the soldiers, the ranks of horses on which any troop movement now depended were becoming rarer and rarer. Often horse-drawn wagons covered the distance to the front of 20 kilometers or more a day, during which time they had to dodge bursting shells and pass under the dagger fire of fighter squadrons. In the closing months, the troops in the Carl and Sack received little meat for their food, and many horses, suffering from shrapnel wounds which were sapping their strength, were turned over to the cooks for meat. After such desperate measures, our hopeless situation became perfectly clear to us. The cooks learned to make baked horse liver with onions. Goulash made of horse meat was added, which brought temporary relief to our lean and sparing rations. In the first days of January 1945, I was given a rare leave of absence for valour, and from my company I took 10 kilograms of smoked horse meat as rations for the time of the road home. The meat was dark red in colour and sweet to the taste, but was nevertheless taken with great relish. After the evacuation of Riga, we again had the opportunity to enjoy fresh sausage that had been rescued from a warehouse in the Latvian capital. As we boarded Wehrmacht trucks and wagons before leaving for our new destination, we stuffed our grocery bags with this delicacy. Despite the advancing Russians, we took with us all the contents of the vodka factory. For several days now, we had been on our feet. Our retreat was carried out at night, and before the beginning of each day, we entrenched ourselves in order to prevent any unexpected attack by the Soviets from our open rear, should the enemy suddenly intend to launch a massive attack in the direction of the Baltic. In front of our retreating troops, the roads were clogged with refugees, fleeing the red menace that was following us on our heels. Yoluk drawn wagons and farm carts, women, children and old men trudging along the soggy roads in columns of misery and sorrow. The regiment took up new positions on Lithuanian soil far south of Frauenburg. The second company of the 437th Regiment occupied the town of Pekilie. In the center of town stood an ancient wooden church, and about 100 yards away was a smaller wooden sanctuary, also at least 200 years old. While we set up our positions, I looked around at the houses in this small settlement and chose the small log structure behind the shrine that housed our communication center. The building was not impressive, but it was solidly built of thick logs and had several rooms that could serve as our administrative offices. Next to our communications hub, I found a small room about three by four meters in size. Light came in through one small window, and on the rough-hewn opposite wall hung an oil painting of the Madonna in a worm-eaten wooden frame. A large old wooden bed occupied the corner of the room next to the painting, complete with a warm but tempting mattress. All the other furnishings had been carried away by previous guests. 
A soft breeze wafted in through the open window. Shards of glass lay on the floor beneath the gaping window frame. I unbuckled my automatic rifle, hung it on a hook protruding from the wall beneath the painting, and stretched out in full uniform for a moment's rest on the bed, so that I could enjoy the unfamiliar luxury at least for a while. From far away came the noise of soldiers working on their equipment and fortifying their positions. I tried to concentrate on our retreat and the rearguard battles of the previous days, and staring at the ceiling in the dim light of the room, I soon fell asleep. I awoke when dusk had fallen upon the settlement near Paikilia, and the diffused golden light of the setting sun was streaming in through the lone window in the room. Lifting myself slightly on the mattress, I could barely make out someone's quiet footsteps. Someone was walking quickly but softly between the houses. I was jerked up sharply by the bursting of several hand grenades behind the wall of my log house, and in the dim light I struggled to my feet and searched for my weapon. I lunged forward, frantically searching for my Miss R-40 assault rifle. Out of the corner of my eye I caught the movement of a figure in a helmet and protective suit appearing in the window. Instantly the barrel of a Soviet assault rifle, recognisable at first glance, slid through the window and the machine gun bursts filled the room with a deafening rumble. Throwing myself on the floor, I crawled as hard as I could to my weapon, which was hanging above me while the bullets were pounding the wall. Keeping my eyes on the window, I saw the round helmet of a Soviet infantryman behind the bright flash from the barrel, under which I could see the clear outline of a round magazine. As I desperately strove to reach my weapon, the enemy machine gun's lines continued to hammer on the wall directly above me, filling the closed room with smoke, powder gas, copper casings and wood chips. Finally I grabbed my MP40, instinctively rolled over onto my back and fired in the direction of the flashes of enemy machine gun fire. Praying to God that a Russian grenade wouldn't follow here, I held the trigger and emptied the entire magazine right through the window. I was out of ammo in seconds, and as I pulled out another magazine, I felt a silence descend on the room. The smoke and dust slowly settled in the diffused light, and in the distance I could hear the frequent firing of machine guns and the occasional explosions of hand grenades, accompanied by the shouts of soldiers defending their positions against the Soviet attack. Taking out an empty magazine and inserting a loaded one into the machine gun, I crawled to the window and cautiously peered out through the broken frame onto the village street. And in seconds it was all over. The enemy soldier who had fired into my room was gone. The only traces of his presence were the dozens of 7.62mm caliber bullet, casings that littered the ground near the window and the floor of the room. Shocked, I surveyed our positions and was relieved to find that we had no casualties. The Soviets had left their two killed and several wounded. I returned to the log building, intending to leave my deceptively attractive place of abode, which had almost proved a death trap for me. As I examined my room, I noticed that a whole line of enemy machine gunfire had passed over an oil painting. The frame had been shattered and destroyed. It was evident that an enemy soldier passing quickly by my window had noticed the movement at the very moment I was sitting on my bed. In his haste, he instinctively stuck the barrel of his automatic rifle through the window and fired at the silhouette visible in the dim light. In the midst of a decisive moment, that silhouette in the painting caught his full attention and he focused fire on it from close, killing distance in a confined space. That alone gave me vital moments to grab my weapon and defend myself. A few days later, the village came under heavy artillery fire, causing a building to catch fire. I took the bullet-riddled painting off the wall and removed it from its mangled frame, determined to stop further destruction of the Madonna whose painted face had saved my life. Then I turned the painting around to take a closer look at the damage done to the canvas, which was several centuries old. It was then that I noticed that despite the long line fired at point-blank range, not a single bullet had hit the face or body of the Holy Virgin. Numerous bullets pierced the background of the painting, forming a deadly halo of fire, but the face remained untouched. This painting was with me at all times, until my last vacation to Germany, where I chose to leave it in the safekeeping of my family as a reminder that 
Whatever the outcome of the war, I would be kept by this painting.